Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Journeys with Jeff. I want to say hello to my friends and neighbors at Court of St. James in West Hartford and congratulate the great Central Connecticut State University football team on a great, great year they're having. And when you meet my guests, you'll understand why I'm congratulating them. Uh, Dr. Catherine Hermes is our guest, and she's a history professor at Central Connecticut. She was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we're going to talk to her today about her career and her journey and uh, how she came to how she came to be here. Catherine, nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great. Great to well, be here. Let's start off with the beginning. Where were you born? Okay, I was I was born in Cincinnati. Big Red Machine era. Um, we don't have to say exactly how old I am, but Big Red Machine era. Wait, wait a minute. And you talk about Cincinnati, the Red, the, the Red Reds. Reds. Yeah. Oh, I remember them. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Johnny Bench. Johnny Bench, Pete Rose. Oh, yeah. yeah, Joe Morgan. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I remember. Yeah. The, yeah. Back in the, they had a great team. That's right. So you were born in uh, Cincinnati. And my dad was a police officer. Uh, my mom was a um, executive uh, secretary, and uh, I have a brother. So we had a nice little life in Cincinnati. Enjoyed it. Were you living in the suburbs, like a suburban, um, a suburban Lived in the city or? for a while, and then we moved out to a little town called Harrison. Uh, you know, my dad wanted to have a few acres so he could have an organic garden and all of that. He was kind of an environmentalist. So you're kind of a country girl. What, what, what do you think you were, what, what are your best memories of the city or being in the country? What are you, The what, city. I like the you city. You like the city? <laughs> I like the city, and I live in downtown Hartford right now. Oh, you so, do? Yeah. You live in downtown yeah. Hartford? Downtown. Is that that apartment building on um, across uh, from the old Foxes there on Main Street? Uh, yes. So I live, yes, it's the old Sage Allen building that I live in. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really nice. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, you were brought up in Cincinnati. You, uh, what, what happened uh, after... You, I take it you went to high school and graduated in Cincinnati. I did manage to graduate from high school. Well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> what, what, what happened after that? Um, so then I bought a one-way ticket to Europe, and I bummed around Europe for a little while. Uh, came back, um, wandered around the United States for a little while until I wound up as a part-time student at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. Yeah. And... Wow. Um, and then I dropped out of college um, and was a cook for a while at um, uh, St. Mary's in Notre Dame and also then in California at the Disneyland Hotel. And I finally realized that it would be good for me to go back to college <laughs> and get a degree. <laughs> Why did you, what made you decide that? Your uh, cooking was hard. <laughs> This is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. I enjoyed it, but it was a lot of physical labor, hard physical labor, and you know, and I, and of course, I always loved, uh, I always loved reading and thinking about history. I, I was always a great fan of history, and so I just thought, and also I had the idea that I wanted to be a lawyer, that, and my dad was encouraging that, and that you can't get there by being a cook. So where'd you go? You went back to school. School. Where'd you go? Uh, University of California at Irvine, and I I went there for two years. I had a terrific mentor, and I want to mention her because um, Christine Hireman, um, because a a good mentor, uh, a good advisor is so important when you're in college, and yeah. I am on the career path I'm on now largely because of her. Because, I, as I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. And that's what I told her. And she said, but, you know, you're, you're actually a very good history student. And you could be a history professor. And I had no idea how to do that. I came from a pretty working class family. I was the first in my immediate family to go to college. So I didn't even know what degree you had to have to be a professor or anything like that. And, uh, and so she said... You could be a legal historian, and then she sold me. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like a lot of people in life, though, there's that one person that says something to us that lights that, that spark that, that uh, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you can do it. I have a, I have right. a friend who was, uh, 
went to Rensselaer, majored in mathematics. He was uh, very tentative about going to get, work on a PhD. Mm -hmm. And he talked to his advisor, mm -hmm. and they were talking about his future. And, and Bob said, well, I don't know, uh, my friend Bob, he said, I don't know about this. I don't feel like I'm up to that. And he looked at my, he said, my advisor looked at me and said, Bob, you can do anything you want. Wow. And he yep. wound up getting a PhD from George Washington University in theoretical physics. Wow. So there's that one, sometimes that one person in our life yep. that can make so much of a difference. Yep. And your advisor did. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where'd you go to school? So then um, she helped me realize that I could be applying to good schools as opposed to some of the schools I had picked out. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I wound up going for my PhD to Yale University. And that certainly changed my life in a you, big and, way. And you, yeah, you went to, you got, you got accepted. Obviously you applied, yeah. you got accepted. Yes. So you, your undergrad transcripts must have been pretty, pretty good. They were decent, yeah. They're decent. Yeah. And you got a PhD in history in from history. Yale. Correct. And then what did you do after you got your PhD in history? Well, I actually, I was on my way to get the PhD and then I stopped to go to law school. And that's where I went to Duke University School of Law, Blue Devils twice, right? Um, yeah. And then I finished up my PhD um, in, and I finally finished that in 1995 when I was living in New Zealand as a professor at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. Wow. That was my first job. It sounds like from what you said after you got out of grad graduated from high school, you went to, to Europe. <clears throat> Sounds like you were, you were afflicted with that wanderlust. I'm um, peripatetic. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Absolutely. Um, well, so you got your PhD, and then what? What did you? Did, what happened at law, Duke Law School? Um, well, so I finished my law degree, but I really always wanted to be a legal historian. Once I once my advisor put that bug in my ear, I wanted to study legal history, and that's what I did. I wrote my dissertation on religion and law in colonial New England, 1620 to 1730. So you got that, and then you got your law degree from Duke, yep. and after you weighed, you just, then you just decided uh, I lived in you New had Zealand. a lot of choices to make. Yeah, I lived in New Zealand for five years as a professor. Uh, well, they, I was a lecturer, that was my rank, um, equivalent to an assistant professor. Um, and I loved New Zealand, I became a permanent resident of New Zealand. But for personal reasons, I moved back to the United States in 1997 and started my job at Central Connecticut State. Wow, wow. And so and I've been here for 22 years, so I stayed put. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No more peripatetic. No, I, I like Connecticut. It, it, well, okay, so here you are in Connecticut. Uh, let, let's, let's uh, your area is colonial, colonial, history? Right. So early American legal history. And I have an emphasis now in Native American history as well. Okay. And I'm sure that what I saw, it, I'm sure a lot of probably some of our viewers uh, may have read the article as I, that I read several weeks ago in The Current, uh, the historical research that you've been involved with of uh, people of color in the ancient burial grounds. Yes. In downtown Hartford, Main and Gold Street. That's correct. And that's something that you've been working on. That was fascinating to hear, read that article about that. Can you tell us more about what that what that uh, project is all about and how you got involved in it and where you know how, how the how your research is going right now? Sure. Well, one of the things professors do from time to time is go on sabbatical, right? And uh, so I had a sabbatical coming up. And I saw a call for proposals from the Ancient Burying Ground Association. It's a private association that runs the burying ground. And they wanted somebody to do an investigation into the people of color, Native Americans, Africans, and African Americans who were buried in the Ancient Burying Ground. And they did not know who those people were because the burying ground was originally about six acres 
and they think there are about 6,000 people buried there, and, but there are only 415 headstones, and so none of them belong to people of color. Most of those six acres are now under the buildings, under these office buildings, right? S some of it's under office buildings, some of it's uh, really under Main Street a little bit. Um, and, but there's still, there's still some acreage there. Yeah, but it's much reduced from well, what it was. So the acreage that there is there, that you're, that's available for you to, what, what, what do you do? You look at the, how do you do your research? You look at the okay. headstones, you, are there records that you're able to, to <laughs> access? Right, so one of the things that they, that the burying ground had was a, what's called a sexton's list. The sexton is the guy who buries people. And from 1749, so 100 years after the burying ground was started, from 1749 to about 1807, there are records for who's in there. And these records were published by antiquarian historians. And what I mean by antiquarians is like local people with a strong interest in history who went through the records and transcribed them and had them printed up. But they left a lot of people out. Um, and that was all they had. And of course, they didn't have any names from before 1749. And so they wanted to see if there were more people. They were, there was like a persistent story that there were about 300 people of color buried in the burying ground. And I don't know where that fact originally came from. So pe people of color you're talking about, are you talking about the black people? Black African people. African Americans, people, uh, yep. Native Americans? Native Americans too, yes. And so this is in colonial, Colonial Hartford. Yes, and just after the revolution. So yeah, before and, uh, 1815. So there were, there were a substantial amount of, there were uh, black people living in Hartford? There were actually, yes there were. Um, and I think this is something that's really hidden in the local history. Um, the first black person to appear in the records of the Connecticut colony um, was an enslaved man, Louis Burbis, who was murdered by his Dutch master in 1639. In, in, in Hartford? In Hartford. He was murdered by his Dutch master. Yes. Now back in those days, that, that was not against the law. Did, would, well. <laughs> was, it, was, it, was he a slave? He was enslaved. So there was, there was slavery in colonial Hartford. Absolutely. From in the 17th century. Yes, from really early, an early time. And, yes. and what about, was there still slavery after the revolution? Um, yes. So Connecticut, after the revolution, Connecticut did pass what's called a gradual emancipation law, but gradual was really gradual, and the last enslaved person was not freed until 1848. In Hartford, wow. In, in Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah, and so in Hartford, um, I, don't, I can't tell you the exact number of people who were enslaved because it's a moving population because people are sold, um, you know, just because someone is purchased as a slave doesn't mean they remain in that household forever. Um, so we found, we have a database of about 500 names for our burying ground. Some of, most of which we think are in there, some of which may not be. And then we probably have another 200 names that we uncovered as living in Hartford in that time period but we couldn't say that they were in the burying ground. So back in those days, in 1650, 1660, 1700, virtually all the people who lived in the Hartford area, farmers, uh, shopkeepers, white people, mm -hmm. slaves, when they died, they were all buried in this one, most of them were buried in this one particular spot. Pretty much. On, um, I mean, a, a few people may have been buried on their own farmland or something. That wasn't typical. Most people were buried in the burying ground. Um, but for example, there's one guy, I don't know if you've ever been down on Market Street, you know, where the yeah. old Catholic church, oh, yeah, uh, St. Paul's. I remember Market Street when I was a little kid. Yep, and there was a little Catholic bookstore. It's all closed up and everything now in a Catholic church. 
Well, there was a guy, his name was Norman Morrison, and he was a Scottish doctor. He died in 1761 of smallpox, as did his son and one of his enslaved men named Tony. And he's buried on Market Street in a corner of the church, um, like outside of the church, to the right of the steps as you're facing the church. So he's got this little, you know, <laughs> Is that still there? You can oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. can. Yeah, you people throw garbage in it sometimes because it's kind of fenced off and looks like a pit. But yeah. you look down and there's his well, tombstone. What, what were Native Americans doing around here back then? Okay, so were they slaves too, or were they free? So it's a complicated question because the the Native people who met Thomas Hooker and Samuel Stone and the guys who settled Hartford were the Wangunk. And most people don't really know the term Wangunk. They haven't heard of them. But the um, chief of Sukiog, which was the name of Hartford before the colonists came, the chief of Sukiog was a man named Sequassen. What was the name of before? Sukiog. And what does that mean? I don't is there know. an interpretation for that? There probably is. Sukiog. Sukiog. Wow. Okay. And, uh, and anyway, so Sequassen was the sachem the chief, and he wanted, he and his father, Soeig, wanted the colonists to come in, and I think they envisioned kind of a joint community, which is not what it turned out to be. Very shortly after the colonists arrived, there was the Pequot War in 1637. So the Wangunk who lived in Hartford and Weathersfield and later Middletown, well, and also Middletown and all along the river, they were not enslaved, but the Pequot prisoners were in, in various states of servitude. Um, a lot of the men were sold into slavery in Bermuda, and some were enslaved or made servants and brought up to Hartford by various colonists, as well as taken into Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So th there was a lot of um, there's a great book, actually a recent book by Margaret Newell called Brethren by Nature, where she explores the issue of Native American slavery in New England. It's very good. Wow. And, and so most of the, 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 uh, the this guy who, whose master killed him, what was it, what you say his name was? His name was Louis Burbis. And, and he was killed by his master. His Dutch master, yes. And, and again, there was no, he, was, he wasn't arrested for that? Well, the master was punished. He was fined. He was fined. It, so it wasn't the equivalent of killing a white person for which he would have perhaps received a sentence of death. Um, but, um, but it was a crime. You weren't, you weren't supposed to kill the people who were entrusted to you. And there's a, a certain paternalistic relationship that you're that a person was supposed to have with the enslaved people in the household yeah yeah wow all right well so how did this uh what's the connection with this work and uh they call it the relationship tree uh, that you're involved with okay so let me tell what's you a little the relationship bit of, tree? well let me tell you a little bit about the website okay so the website we have a list of these 500 people that I mentioned. And when you click on any individual's name, you're taken to a set of information about them. We, we kind of envision it as a virtual headstone. And we have an ancestry.com family tree that we started for every named person that we have. Just for the viewers, yeah. Could you tell us what, what is the website so that they, they okay. might want to jot it down? Right. So the website is www.africannativeburialsct, like Connecticut, dot org. And it should show up on the um, slides that I provided uh, that okay, will show up okay. in, the, okay, good. in the broadcast. Okay. Um, and so that website, as I say, there are these list of names. Each person has this profile, and the Ancestry.com trees are there to help people who are doing their own family genealogies reach back and maybe connect 
with the people that we found because it's very hard to do the research we did. But the thing about an ancestry tree, I don't know if you've ever done one. No. I've, I've oh. done mine and I've done some others. And you know, you can put your fifth cousin 15 times removed in that tree, but you can't put your best friend, you can't put your business partner. And for our purposes, we could not put in a master-slave relationship or uh, native kin relationships where we didn't perhaps know if it was a maternal cousin or a paternal cousin or that kind of thing. Mm. So we at Central Connecticut State, some computer science and I worked, students and I worked on a computer program, they invented it for me, called Relationship Tree. And I think it's great. What we can do now is map the relationships of anybody. Um, and so we'll, we'll have an example um, where we know Norman Morrison, for example, that I just mentioned. He was a part owner of two slave ships that went to Africa and brought back people to the Hartford area. And we can put all of those slaves from the slave ships in, uh, in a graph that shows the ship, the people who were on the ship, the farm that they went to in Bolton or in Hartford, and it shows all the relationships and interconnectedness of people. So what's the source of, where, where did you get most of this information? Is it at the state capitol? Where, where, where is it? Um, what archives are they in now? <laughs> we did most of our research at the state library, but we used we used probate records, um, court records. And they, all these probate re these records go all the way back to colonial America. They do, and they've been kept intact. Yes, in the in the in the state library. State library. Yes, and um, we we used um, church records on microfilm. We used. Um, a thing called the Siemens Protection Certificates, which are online through Mystic Seaport. And those were certificates issued to sailors after the United States was a country to protect them from being seized while they were on the water. Can you, can you think of uh, any a couple of, of examples of what you came across that kind of like startled you that stood out in any oh, interesting? Oh yeah, the, the, the big thing one of the very first people I found was actually in the probate records, a man named Philip Moore, who died in 1695. He was a free black man, the 17th, late 17th century, he left a will. And then his wife left a will, and his son left a probate administration. And so the whole, f we were able to trace the family from Philip Moore Sr., Jr., Philip Moore III, and Philip III's children. And so we have um, four generations of the Moore family. And this was a, a, a freed slave. I don't really know if he was enslaved, I assume so. He gets land after King Philip's War in 1676. That's when he first appears in the records. And he's a farmer in what is now um, East Hartford in Hockenham. So kind of where, uh, Goodwin Colleges over by there. And um, he was a, he and his family went to the church in Hartford, the first church. And um, his um, daughter-in-law and all of her children were full church members um, in the congregational church. Now is this, uh, Catherine, is this research uh, project, the historical research of these people, is it, uh, you have a sense, is it pretty much exhausted in terms of all the information of you? At what phase is it in, in its development here? Are you almost done with it or is it, is there gonna be a right. book about it or? So I completed, I completed my part of the research. Originally what the Burying Ground Society wanted was a, a, a report, you know, with the names in it. And I thought a website would be better because it would make it accessible to the public. So we created this website. The website has profiles. It has narratives about various issues in the colonial period related to the people we found. Um, it has a downloadable database. And my part is now finished. Um, it, 
definitely needs like a curriculum around it for the local schools and somebody else will be taking that over. Yeah, yeah, so educators could probably take all what you've gotten there, what you've gleaned, what you've learned and uh, come up with a good a good curriculum. Right. Sounds fascinating. Yeah, and I, and that's, you know, beyond kind of my expertise. I I wouldn't really be the right person to create that curriculum, so they're going to hand that over to to a new team. Okay, but you've uh, you've got the people have the have the website and uh, we're just about, I just want to ask you a few questions just to kind of wrap up your Catherine Hermes story here. Um, you've had a lot of experiences from Cincinnati to Boise State to yeah. uh, of traveling all, all over the world, teaching over in New Zealand, a law degree. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm boggled. <laughs> what, what, what are, <clears throat> as you've gone along the road of your life, what uh, can you think of a one or two of the most important things you've learned about life, about yourself, about people uh, from your experiences? Well, I I think one of the big oh, well, you know, it's tough to kind of sum it all up, but I, I find that when you open yourself up to new experiences, that you can just be so enriched. And I want to say that every time I made a move, going to Europe, going to New Zealand, I was terrified. I, didn't, I, I was really afraid to do these things in many ways, but I conquered my fear. And I'm not saying no bad things ever happened. Uh, there were a few bad things. But I, I feel so lucky to have done that. And I hope that people will take the opportunities to travel, meet new people, try new things. Uh, it's been the delight of my life to do that. What would you do, do over? If you could do something over, would you do anything over? Yeah, I'd be nicer to my parents. <laughs> I would pay more attention to my parents. You look better, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I could share that regret. And influences, I mean, sometimes it sounds to me like, from what you've just said, that one advisor that you yeah. had, uh, this, this one person really seems to have been an influence in your life. She, in addition to encouraging me, she also happened to assign as reading uh, a, a book that changed my life uh, by Edmund Morgan. It was called American Slavery, American Freedom. And it, it totally transformed my life. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Because, you know, I grew up during the civil rights era, obviously, my father was a police officer. There were riots in Cincinnati, but my father was a very, um, my father believed in respecting all people. And I think sometimes went against the grain of the police department a little bit. Um, and, and so I thought of myself as a person who was not racist or you know, anything like that. But, um, but when I read American Slavery, American Freedom, it, showed me that there's this paradox, you know, that we have a country built on the idea of liberty, but they had all these enslaved people. And I never realized how much freedom depended on the fact that there were people enslaved. Um, and that was the, the thesis of the book. And it got me to question, like, what does my own freedom depend on? Are there people today? who are in some sort of bondage, who are making my freedom possible. And it, it really transformed me. Well, thank you very much. You're, basically, you're saying that it's, we learn from our experiences, keep an open mind, and keep questioning. Keep questioning yourself Always. and your own, your own opinions. Always. Thank you very much. Catherine, thank you very much. Well, it's been a pleasure to be we, here. We'd uh, just like to thank you guys for uh, tuning in, and please um, try to contact uh, Catherine uh, on her website. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you next time. Have a good night.